It's quite the dynamic introduction. Speaking at Google in front of a room of people, many of them virtual, would never have happened to me a few years ago. Now, every week I'm talking with Eric Schmidt, you might have heard of him, I assume. This is a good crowd for that one. Uh, then I'm off to Howie Mandel or Chelsea Handler or Kobe Bryant. But when I was a kid, I had, I don't even, I think now they call it social anxiety. Back then it was just, you're a big weirdo. And I think a lot of people can kind of identify with me when I talk about this. I hated school because I felt like the attention, there was attention on me that I just didn't want. Any sort of attention on me was negative. And so I started skipping school a lot. And it wasn't the cool kind of skipping school where you're singing on a parade float like Ferris Bueller. It was the kind of skipping school where at 5 p.m. your parents come home and you're playing video games in your underwear on the computer. And so I didn't have this very outgoing dynamic life as a kid. And when I got to college, I realized that this system is not working for me. It's not getting any better. It's not an anxiety disorder or anything like that. I just don't like I'm an introvert, you might say. Now there's personality tests for that. And all of my friends from college went to the University of Michigan. They all had these awesome, bright futures. They would go work for the biggest tech company, which at the time was AOL. So they were headed to Virginia. And yeah, a little tech company called AOL. Or they were working in finance. You know, They were off to New York, and they had to buy different jeans to fit in with all the cool guys in New York. And I needed some time to figure it out. I know some people probably can identify with that as well. And what that means is didn't really know what the heck I wanted to do with my life and everything else sounded kind of boring. And my parents, you know, my mom was a special ed teacher at a public school. My dad was an auto worker. They had jobs that were great for their time, but I didn't really want to follow in those footsteps. So I was pretty uninspired. And I thought that there would be some sort of magical lightning bolt that would help me figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And that system wasn't working for me either. One day, I woke up bright and early. Again, it's college, so it's probably 2 p.m., maybe 1. And I walked into Best Buy. I needed a new disc man with anti-skip technology and Megabase. And I ran into a buddy of mine. And I was like, hey, I don't know. What are you doing for the summer? He's like, well, I, I'm working here. I'm actually going to be working in the computer department. Why don't you start working with me here? And I thought, great. I just sort of accidentally stumbled my way into this job. And he said, well, you know, you can't do what you do, right? You can't build computers like you do at home. You can't help customers with problems. You need to sell music first. And I said, for how long? And he said, well, I don't know, maybe like the first two years. So I saw my bright future go down the tubes in front of a life-size cutout of Britney Spears. And I decided that that system wasn't going to work for me either. I didn't want to sell CDs. I mean, the guys I was working with or would have been working with at that point were all sophomores in high school, and I just graduated from college. Like, what, what's happening? I'd been wronged by this system that was supposed to deliver me the inspiration to find a perfect job and then hand it to me on a silver platter. And so I did what a lot of guys do when they run out of career options, and I became an attorney. So law school was tricky for me as well, right? I, I went there thinking, good, I can fake my way through a geometry test. Good, I can fake my way through a social studies exam. I don't even know what that subject is anymore, if it even still exists. But that was my strategy through high school. College, my strategy shifted a little because everybody was pretty smart at Michigan. And luckily, they had discovered drinking for the first time. So all I had to do was show up to class and do a little bit of the homework. And I was in the top 25% because I wasn't partying all the time and waking up at noon anymore. And so, I finally was able to get into a great law school because I worked my butts up, butt off in that place either. I'd lost my competitive advantage of being smarter than a lot of the average kids in my high school or in my middle school, but everybody was hardworking once I got to Wall Street. And that was a huge problem. That was a big problem for me because my other competitive advantage, which was a work ethic, that had also evaporated, right? Walking in on the geometry test and, and winging it and doing fine, that was great. And then outworking people in undergrad and law school, that was great. But now, this is Wall Street. Everyone here is really smart. Everyone's really hardworking. I'm going to get fired. It's only a matter of time. Now we know this is called imposter syndrome because all of you may have had that at one point or another where you're like, okay, I'm working at Google. Don't blow it. Make, keep a low profile. Maybe they won't notice I don't belong here. I slip through the cracks. I see people giggling because they're like, yeah, I still have that. And I totally get it. 
right? Or at least when you started, you had that. That's very normal. It turns out that that's actually a trait of high performers. You know who doesn't have imposter syndrome? Teenagers, because they know everything and nothing could possibly be new for them. They don't have, when I give this talk or a similar talk at a high school, they're all like, never happened to me, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Whenever I go to like Harvard, or Google, Apple, they're like, oh, I have that. Is that ever gonna go away? Kinda, maybe, usually a little bit, but not all, never completely. In fact, I asked, Eric Schmidt this same question on an episode of my podcast, and he was like, I don't know if I should admit that I still have this sometimes. This is the guy who ran the place for a long time. Uh, I looked him up on Forbes, not doing too bad, right? Still feels this from time to time. So that's a big deal, and that's a big indicator that this is, this is a good sign, even though it feels like a bad one. And when I got hired on Wall Street, the guy who hired me, his name was Dave, and he was never in the office, and I thought, this guy is onto something because if I can figure out how to never be in the office, then they won't find out that I don't belong here. It, and I'll have plenty of time to figure out how to do this lawyer thing. And then by the time they're like, where's Jordan been for the last nine months? I'll come in and I'll know what I'm doing and then maybe they won't fire me. That was literally my strategy. I wish that was a joke. So, and I knew Dave was smart, right? Cause he was from Brooklyn and he had a tan. So obviously he knew something that nobody else knew. And this guy was never there. And he had like a, a limp. He'd come in sometimes with a limp and I go, oh, what happened to your knee? Oh, I was doing jujitsu and then I went to Brazil and then I did, was playing golf and I aggravated this injury in my knee. And I thought, okay, so wait a minute. He's not just working from home. He just appears to not do any work really somehow. And he was supposed to mentor me. And on Wall Street, what that means is there's a checkbox on an HR form somewhere. And they're like, you have to mentor this one new guy. Everybody else is going to see Blue Man Group, going out to really fancy lunches. This guy, my mentor was never in the office, so I didn't get squat. And HR kept asking me, have you been mentored yet by Dave? And I was like, no, I've never seen him. Or if you have seen him once in the elevator. And then he ran away uh, with a bum knee. <laughs> and so... I was like, I don't, I'm not getting a mentorship program here. What's happening? So they were like, I, I don't know the exact email exchange, but I think it was, dear Dave, can you please come in once this summer, August, July, doesn't matter, mentor this guy, whatever that means to you. Because he came in one day, and I remember it because I went down to meet him and the managing partner, who's like the CEO of the law firm, he was in the elevator and he goes, uh-oh, what's going on? Dave's in the office. That's how little this guy was there that the managing partner thought something, joked around that something might be wrong because this guy actually showed up. He goes, I'm here to mentor. And he said it with such just absolute defeat that I just couldn't wait for my session. And I didn't go to Blue Man Group. I didn't go to McCormick and Schmick or Morton Steakhouse. We went to the Starbucks in the basement of the office building. And he said, all right, ask me anything you want. And he's hammering away on his Blackberry and answering emails. And I said, well, how come you're never in the office but you're a partner and a lot of, you know, you make a lot of money. And he goes, who said that? Who said I'm never here and that I make a lot of money? And now I'm just like backtracking because I'm like, oh, I'm going to get fired at Starbucks. Like this was a mistake. I should have just kept my freaking mouth shut. Everything would have been fine. And I said, oh, that's kind of, you know, the word around here is that you're never around, but like you, you must work from home or something. Right. And he goes, sometimes, but mostly I generate business for the firm. And that was like Greek to me. I had no idea what that even meant. That changed the way that I look at work forever. Cause what does that mean? You generate business for the firm. How's, how, how are you outside, not in the office, generating business for the firm? And that really was, that made no sense to me. And he said, well, I, I have friends all over the place at Goldman Sachs or Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns or whatever investment bank we were working with as clients. And if they are out biking, doing jujitsu, golfing, going to a charity thing, playing squash, whatever, I just join them because my value outside the office is more valuable. There's more value there than, than inside the office. I don't worry about my billable hours, which is how most of us as lawyers make money for the firm. I don't worry about my billable hourly bonus because I get paid a percentage of the deals that I get for the firm. And I, and I was like, well, can anybody do that? And he said, yeah, we would love to have people generate business for the firm. What does your dad do? And I was like, uh, not anything that's going to bring a million dollar deal to this financial law firm. And he goes, well, you just have to be cool, man. Just network and, you know, you'll be fine. You'll be able to bring in business. That was really good advice and also not advice at all, because what does that mean? Go network, be cool, man. Like, it, gee, if I'd known I could just do that, would I have become a lawyer in the first place? Probably not. 
right? And I, I love my lawyer buddies, but I'll tell you, being cool, not one of the things that we're usually known for. And being outgoing, charismatic, and having lots of friends around us, also not something that most attorneys are known to be naturally good at. And so I, again, had lost my competitive advantage, but I had this seed planted in my head where I thought, okay, if everyone's working really hard and trying to outwork each other and everyone's trying to outsmart or be smarter than the next person, he's telling me to generate business and he's one of the youngest partners in the firm. This is kind of the secret third pathway that nobody's talking about. This whole generating relationships, building connections, this is like a secret third path. And if I get good at this, then by the time I am fifth year or something, junior level associate, senior level associate, I will be able to, I'll have such a huge advantage in bringing in business for the firm that I won't have to worry about what other people are starting to do because I will have a five-year head start. They're already gonna, these other colleagues of mine, they're already gonna be hard, hardworking, as hardworking as me or harder. They're already going to be smarter than me, or at least that's how it felt. But if I get a really good runway and I don't talk about this very much, then I have a distinct advantage. I get my competitive advantage back and maybe I don't get fired. That was, again, my actual strategy. Dave wasn't the most skilled lawyer. He probably wasn't even the smartest lawyer. He just was the best connected. And he did that very deliberately so that he could write his own ticket. It was his relationships that brought in the business. And that was brand new for me. I thought you worked your way up to the top, dot, 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 country club network. That's how I thought that worked until I met Dave. It turns out it's actually the other way around. You network your way until you're valuable enough to be made partner, country club optional, right? His people skills were the rarest in the firm. And since they were so rare, they made him one of the most valuable people at the firm entirely. And so that's when I realized that in order to succeed inside a system, inside a corporation, inside a law firm, I had to work outside the system entirely. And that finally, after 25 years or so of education and working, had finally clicked for me. And that was amazing. That changed the way that I looked at work forever. And now I know that in the professional sphere and in the personal sphere for that matter, the strength of your relationships translates directly to opportunity, flexibility, and prosperity, right? The more money you make, the more networks and relationships you have, the more money you make, the more flexibility you have in your job, like working from home like Dave, becoming a partner early is a clear advantage and a clear opportunity that most people don't have. How many people like networking? Not many, right? Like one or two hands always go up when I ask this. A lot of people, they do, yeah, they do one of these. I totally get this. I'm also one of these, right? Most people don't like networking, and I get it. There's a fundamental difference between people that are like, oh, I like this, I enjoy the process, and people that hate it. And that's what is inside your head, the image you have of networking. For most of us, what it is is, you walk into some place and you're like, all right, I'm at a networking mixer, gonna drink some stale, punch and get like a hard cookie or whatever and stand in the corner and then someone's like hey uh where are you investing your retirement funds and you're like no right you know what's happening it's just used car salesman type stuff over and over again and you're eyeballing the door and then you're like i'm gonna check my email uh, or pretend to because everybody around me is being really weird and wants something from me so nobody likes that nobody likes being a target of that and nobody wants to be like that because you're all good people and being like those people sounds horrible so instead, we just don't network at all. We don't generate relationships at all because we decide it's disgusting and hateful and dirty and it's a dirty word and we don't like talking about it. And what we're gonna learn a little bit today is how to leverage connections to hustle opportunities or build opportunities for yourself inside a, a corporation or a company in a way that is, doesn't make the other party or yourself feel like you need a sulfuric acid shower after the fact, and will turn something that most of us dread into one of your largest competitive advantages. Everybody's always heard that it's not what you know, it's who you know, but when we hear that or when someone says that or when we say it, usually we throw some stank on the end of it, right? Because it means we didn't get an opportunity that we thought we deserved and someone else did, or it means you're not networking enough and you need to get that under your belt before you can be in our management group or join this project. Very few people go, I have an unfair advantage and I'm really appreciating that right now. Very few people will admit that. That's what building strong networks is. It is, an, it is a fair but seemingly unfair advantage that you've put a ton of work into. And people that are well connected, we often assume it's unfair because we think they were born into it. And I'll get to that in a second. But I think we all know 
that even inside companies like Google, for example, brilliant ideas can fail if you don't get buy-in from the people around you. I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody in this room. Whenever I say that, there's a lot of people who kind of like shamefully look down at their iPad or their, oh, sorry, their Chromebook, and <laughs> they, they, they don't want anything to do with that, right? And when I first started learning about networking, like I said, I thought you were born into a secret club, you went to school, you had a little blazer, you had shorts, you had to pull your socks up. That was how you got your network or like your, so it's hit too close to home for some people over here, I think. Um, or you had good neighbors, you went to a fancy private school. If you're born into it, I get it. For those of us that were not, we have to teach our own kids this stuff, right? Their parents maybe taught them what I'm gonna teach you now. If your parents didn't do that, you gotta do it for your own kids. Otherwise, they're gonna grow up and go, wah, it's all about who you know and put stank on it and have this, uh, tell, talk about how other people have an unfair advantage. If you can marry into it, highly recommended also, but I don't think all of us have that kind of foresight, unfortunately, I certainly didn't. With intentional application of these skills though, you can create a better network than somebody who was born into it. And the reason for this is because they are, it's the tortoise and the hare. It's really as simple as that. They're born into it. A lot of people who are born into it don't appreciate it. And when they don't appreciate it, they don't have their foot on the gas. And if you go, I remember distinctly uh, a friend of mine who now works here, uh, actually, who <laughs> went to law school with me, great guy. I remember thinking, I will never know or have as many connections as this guy. He's popular and his family knows people. I'm never going to build that kind of network. Now though, I look at all those people similar to him that I met back in the day and I go, how do you not know more people? You've lived here for a long time. How do you not have these opportunities? The reason is because I've had my foot on the gas for a really long time, for 10 years, 11 years with these types of systems. You can easily surpass these types of people. And it's not a competition. I just want to outline and highlight the idea that if you look at people and you go, well, they're naturally good at this, or wow, they have a massive leg up on me for this, that is very, very temporary. If they're not working hard to maintain those relationships, they often will evaporate with their older, their parents, their grandparents. I know tons of attorneys that could have gotten a job anywhere and did and had tons of opportunity and then their grandfather retired or passed away and then they went, oh, uh, I, don't, I can't just make a quick call now and get whatever I want. They, they learn the hard way. We can build the foundation and not have to worry about that problem. Now, networking and relationship building properly, it is a way of being, it is a set of habits. I moved to the Bay Area from LA a few years ago now, but people that I know that grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, they'll tell me, wow, you know so many people. I, I grew up here, I, don't, I know a lot of people, but you really know a lot of people. Again, I have my foot on the gas. I'm not going out and networking, that's what, a lot of people think this is like, oh, well, maybe if you just go out every night and you're glad handing, that's not at all what I'm doing. This stuff doesn't turn off. I'm consistently looking for opportunities for other people, and I'll get to what that means in a second, with everyone that I meet. I'm consistently introducing people to one another, and I'll tell you how to do that in a bit as well, because once you see the matrix on this, there's no going back, and the skills go to work for you. You don't have to like get psyched up and be on and get your business cards ready and go out and network. It's a thing that just happens throughout your daily life. That's the way to handle it. Trust me, that's a lot easier than the other way and trying to do a performance act where you're suddenly networking and going to these mixers, which by the way are almost universally completely useless. N rule of thumb, never go to an event, a networking mixer that's open to anyone. The more curated, the better. And by curated, I mean we're only inviting people that do AV tech for large tech companies in Silicon Valley. Those are the events you guys want to go to. You don't want to go to tech networking mixer at Chili's. Like that will be the death of you, trust me. Just, yeah, I know you've been to one or two, never again, right? And everyone has the capacity to do this stuff. How many people are introverts? You took Myers-Briggs and you're like, cool, I got a medical excuse to not network, so cool, this talk was fun, but I am an introvert, INTJ, I don't have to do any of this stuff. I get it, this is, turns out, unfortunately for us introverts, Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet and is brilliant, she found some really good science that says, us introverts 
are better at connecting with other people because we actually listen to what they have to say, think about what they might be feeling, think about what we're feeling at the time, and then we use that information to connect rather than just barging into a group of people like a lot of extroverts do and yelling and screaming about how great they are and follow me on Instagram, right? The, the introverts are actually better at connecting. It just doesn't feel that way because when we're introverted, we go home and recharge with some me time. Like, I'm not gonna go give another talk after this. I'm gonna go in my room and curl up in the fetal position or whatever and, and turn on an audiobook. Like, that's what we do to recover. And that is normal. So it doesn't mean that you can't build this skill set. It just means that the way that you rest as an introvert and recover is, is that me time. So no more medical excuse. In your homegrown network, the relationships you create, this is what keeps opportunity coming into your life at an unstoppable flow. Opportunities come from people that know, like, and most importantly, trust you. They know, like, and trust you. And it's actually more important to be trusted than it is to be liked. And a lot of people will argue with me on this, but frankly, I've done tons of business with people I don't necessarily like, but I trust. And I've done only, I've only regretted doing business with people that I like, but don't trust as much. And I think if you think about it, that makes sense. You can make your friends elsewhere. You don't necessarily want them to be your boss, especially if you can't trust them. So by the way, this is pure job security because Dave, when our firm, the guy who hired me on Wall Street, when our firm hit economic hard times in 2007, 2008, he dipped and he went to another firm as a partner. Everybody else that I worked with was punished, pretty much everybody was punished by the recession. Dave ended up an, as a partner at another firm. And I know this because I saw him in the elevator after I left. I was doing the Jordan Harbinger show on Sirius XM satellite radio in New York City. And I saw him in the elevator and he goes, don't I know you from somewhere? And I, was, I said, I don't know, maybe. Because I didn't want to have anything. I, yeah, I dipped from that firm that you also left and now is going out of business. Right? I didn't want anything to do with that. And also because I think he probably resented every second that he had to spend with me in that basement Starbucks. And I don't want to, I don't want to traumatize anyone. Most people procrastinate. right? When it comes to relationships, they go, all right, I get it. Jordan, I'm going to do that. But first, I need to finish this project. Then I'm going to build this website for my business, my side hustle, whatever. And then I'm going to get my business cards printed. And then I, but I got to design those first. So that's going to take a while. This, this is backwards. This is not an add on skill set. Relationship development is foundational. It's not a bonus. It's not something you do on your to do list. You have to start early because, and you'll hear this phrase from me a lot, it's from Harvey McKay. You have to dig the well before you're thirsty. You don't create relationships when you need them. And I'll explain why in a second, but of course you all kind of instinctively know why because it's happened to everyone. And if you decide to willfully ignore this skill set, you're not immune to the consequences. You're just being willfully ignorant of the secret game that is being played around you. And that is a huge problem because you can bury your head in the sand all you want and say, I'm the best coder at this place. I've got the most tribal knowledge of this project or this particular sub skill set. If you don't know people that can help you get your next item or next project or next gig or move up the ladder, you will eventually be obsolete. You can work and be the best at something, but if you don't have opportunity coming from your connections, you will always run into problems. I, my inbox on the Jordan Harbinger show, I give advice every Friday. My inbox is full of people from tech company A that are the number one, whatever, security, whatever it is, person, and they know this thing back and forth, and someone they hired four years ago is their boss now, and they're having a crisis about it. And the reason is because their manager says, well, you just, you're not much of a manager, you know, you don't really have th that skill set we're looking for, but we really love you in this basement cubicle coding and COBOL or whatever it is, right? Like we love having you here for that. So you're not going anywhere, Jim. And they're like, that's the problem. So you have to be open to these opportunities. And the way that you do that is by making connections, not by hoping that lightning strikes. Now, I've, I always love giving little practical exercises and my show is full of these practicals. And one that I will give you right now, <clears throat> this is called layoff lifelines. And what this is, imagine that you get laid off today and that's terrible and unfortunate. But who are the 10 or so people that you would contact to solicit their advice on what to do next? Who are the 10 or so people that you would contact and say, what do I do? Yeah, your parents, okay, next. 
But who is it? It's the college professor that advised you on your master's thesis or whatever. It's somebody that you met at your old job, maybe your old boss that you lost touch with when you came here to Google. Maybe it's a, a friend of yours that you know is running a startup, but you know he's really busy and you're really busy and life gets in the way. Who are those people that you wish you had kept in touch with? Make that list now and then reach out to those people also now before you need anything. Because if you don't have anything on your agenda, this is a lot easier to reach out to somebody. If you don't have, if you don't need anything or want anything from them, you actually just want to reconnect. It's a much smoother process because who here has gotten like a text, phone call, email, whatever from someone in high school. And you're like, they're like, Hey Jordan, what's going on? You're like, Amanda, who? And you're just like, Oh wait, Herbalife or Scientology. What's it going to be? Herbalife or Scientology, like what's going on? It's gonna be something. And then they're like, oh, saw you're up to so many cool things. Love your pics on IG. Anyway, I'm running this amazing work from home business and I wanna loop you in on it. And you're like, knew it, no thanks, bye. And then you, you, you went from not knowing them anymore to never wanting to talk to them ever again. And that's really toxic. And a lot of us don't realize that even something that's a little bit more sympathetic, okay, a lot more sympathetic, like, hey, I just got laid off. Is your place hiring? That's more sympathetic, but what's much more sympathetic is reaching out to somebody you talked to six months ago, even if it was just an email, maybe three months ago, and you say, hey, um, speaking of this, look, I just totally ate a bad sandwich here at my company, and I was wondering if you knew of any opportunity. That seems a lot more realistic and a lot more, frankly, friendly and honest and authentic than somebody who calls you, offers you a quick little piece of value, or just asks you for something out of the blue. And so what this layoff lifelines exercise does is it re-engages some of your most important but most neglected relationships. And this is a good thing to do. It'll take you maximum half an hour, including making the list and finding their contact information and reaching out to 10, 12, 15 people. I highly recommend that you do this. And it will make you feel a lot better. And what happens is you end up with a lot more opportunities because, and this is my next little, I guess, bold bullet if you're taking notes, opportunities are usually over the horizon. And what that means is you don't know what kind of opportunity you're going to get from connecting with someone. I, uh, when I moved to LA, this is a while ago now, I pre-Uber, there was no Uber back then. I had a toothache and I was looking for dentists around me. And everyone that I called was like, hey, we don't take your insurance. Or I, I don't even think I had insurance. Who am I kidding? It was like 2009. I didn't have insurance. I just got out of the law firm. I started the Jordan Harbinger show. And I couldn't get this toothache fixed. And everybody else was like, oh, we don't take new patients, whatever. So in desperation and poor privacy settings, I posted on Facebook. And somebody I don't even know responded and was like, my aunt has an office, a dental office near you. Do you want me to call her? And I said, yes, please, I'll do anything other than going to the ER and tying a string around it and like slamming the door, which is what I think is gonna happen if I go to the ER. And so this guy helps me find a dentist through his aunt. She fixes my tooth, opens up early like the next day, doesn't overcharge me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, anything you need, man, let me know. I owe you huge. He goes, well, I, right now I'm a barista, but I, I love graphic design and I, I have my portfolio. Do you need anything? I didn't need anything. I know that would be really convenient if I did, but I didn't need anything. I'm like, well, I'll keep my ear to the ground for you because you know I owe you once, the least I can do. So a few days later, probably more like a week, two weeks later, a friend of mine who does client designs, website designs, she goes, do you know, who, do, who designed your website? Do you know anyone? Do you have this in-house or do you outsource it? I said, ours is in-house, but I happen to have this portfolio from this guy. I know he's really hungry. Her designers kept bouncing for better gigs. And I said, this guy, He's making coffee right now, but he wants to do graphic design. She's like, good, I can probably afford him in that case. He ended up with an $80,000 a year job, full time, quit working at the cafe making coffee to go work for my friend. The reason he got that opportunity was because he helped me find a dentist on Facebook. I've never met this person even today. I have never met them in real life. If he had decided to help me only based on what I could do for him, he never would have done it. And if I had reached out to every graphic designer that I knew, uh, that I'd ever met in my whole life before that, based on my friend needing something from me, I couldn't have provided him. I met him because he helped me without the attachment to anything in return. And that's the key. You know, sit down and think about this list when you get home. Spend 30 minutes. You never know who you can help and who might help you. 
And this horizon, the fact that opportunities lie over the horizon, we can't predict the outcome of a given relationship. We rely on what we call, what I call ABG, always be generous or always be giving. You, have you seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, ABC, always be closing, always be closing business. That's like, go get them, always be trying to get hustle someone to give you something. This is always try to figure out how to help someone else. You don't have to create free graphics for their website. All you have to do is make introductions. That's what makes this scalable, right? I'm not mowing everyone's lawn because they can't afford a landscaper. I am creating connections between people that come into my orbit. So if I know someone that's like, man, I really need a computer security expert, I'm not like, man, I better learn computer security and help my friend out. That's not what's happening at all. What's happening is I'm thinking about who's in my Rolodex and connecting those people to see who that who can help. That is scalable. I can do that 100 times a week if I wanted to. It doesn't cost me any, much of any time at all. I can do it at an airport gate. Most opportunities lie over the horizon. We don't find them unless you're practicing ABG, helping other people without the attachment to anything in return. Always be generous. Also, this is logistically easier because think about this. You go to a, a party with your friend and you, you're looking for a new job and you go and talk to somebody and they're a lawyer and you're like, oh, I don't wanna work at a law office. So now what? You start looking over their shoulder, you're trying to find a way to end the conversation. You're trying to get a job in the tech sector. What if you weren't looking for what was in it for you, but you were just looking to hook up other people in your network with something that could value them? Now, all you have to do is elicit from this attorney, what is he looking for? Clients, what is he looking for? A paralegal. Now you have options and every interaction you have is valuable for your network. You're not looking at what's in it for you, you're looking at what's in it for everyone that you know. That is a much, much wider net and it is much easier to fit those Legos together. Your network then, when you do this right, becomes your value proposition. It's not your particular business or skill set. So a lot of people who are maybe in university or something, they'll go, well, I'm, I'm like 21. I don't know, I don't have any money. I don't have a skill set. I have no work experience, doesn't matter. If they're applying this, they can go, well, I know this Jordan guy is like a podcast guy and he's, you know, he would probably do consulting for this company that I just heard needs a corporate podcast. Maybe I can introduce them. That's valuable for me and for the company. It doesn't matter that this 21 year old kid is the conduit for it. It doesn't matter if it's a high school kid. I don't care if he's 15 years old. The relationship, the introduction is what matters. So you become valuable because of that. This is important because it's a numbers game, right? And the way you increase your odds in a numbers game is you simply keep rolling the dice. So some introductions are gonna yield fruit, most of them won't. You have to be okay with that. Because if you're counting on them always bringing something back to you, it poisons the well. And I'll talk about why that's destructive in a few minutes. But you should look like the person who's constantly getting lucky. Like, how do you get all these opportunities? How did you end up with a talk at Google? How did you end up getting featured by Apple or win that award? It's about creating surface area for what might look like luck, but it's about relationships. And I think it might be Naval Ravikant or something that talks about surface area for luck. It's very, very true. The more opportunity you're creating for yourself, the more likely you are to get a hit. So in the next week, introduce two or more people you know don't already know each other. And you do this using the double opt-in introduction. What that means is you start off by saying, do you know that you email each party separately? Let me be really clear here. Each party separately. Do you know this person? No. Do you know this person? No. Okay, if they don't know each other, you've confirmed that. Would you be open to being introduced to so-and-so? You ask both sides whether they know each other and whether they're open to an introduction. This is important because one side might say no. And if they say no, then you go back and you tell the, the third party or the other party, hey, this isn't a good time for this. We can circle back on it in six months. What you don't want to do, here's what we want to avoid. Hey, Jordan, meet my friend Zeeb. He's pretty cool. He really wants to spend a lot of time with you and not give you anything in return. And then I have to turn around and go, oh, I'm really busy. Just had a baby recently. Uh, I don't really have time for this right now. And then he goes, great, I'll circle back with you every Monday for the rest of your life. Now I have to deal with that, right? I don't wanna deal with that, it's not fair to me. So you as the third party, you're doing a double opt-in. It's your responsibility to find out if the introduction is valuable, if both parties are interested, and if there's a no from either one, it's your job, your responsibility, your obligation to handle that social awkwardness so the other party doesn't lose face.
This is extremely valuable. And what it does is it signals professionalism. When you go to introduce people like this, they will always trust you with making good introductions because they know you're not just throwing their name in the hat for everything or name dropping them to do something that's good for you, right? Like, oh, I'm gonna introduce you to this person to make myself look good. You're not doing that with a double opt-in. You're getting their permission first. That's much more valuable. It also has the added bonus of making sure that those two parties actually connect. Because if you just randomly introduce people to me in an email chain and I don't want that intro, I might delete it and if they don't reply, then I'm off the hook. But if I tell you I'll take that intro and the other person says, yes, I'll take that intro, I am 10, 100 times more likely to respond to that. And they're 10 times more likely to respond to that as well. So your success rate for those introductions goes through the roof, thus helping you accrue what we might call referral currency or social capital at a much higher rate. Now, that's your homework. Two introductions, use the double opt-in. The other side of your homework is, on the other side of the equation, think of a challenge you yourself are dealing with and ask someone you know for an introduction to somebody who might be able to help you. You don't have to ask them to help you. You have to ask them for an introduction to somebody who might be able to help you. Does that make sense so far? Great. Great. Now, your network is unique to you. I'm not gonna beat this point to death because we just talked about the 21-year-old kid who can make a valuable introduction. But a lot of times when companies, y'all have seen Shark Tank, right? So we know that often people will turn down deals or go for specific deals because they, they wanna work with Mark Cuban or they could have taken, in fact, everyone on Shark Tank could have gotten a better deal at pretty much any VC firm anywhere around here. They go to Shark Tank for publicity and they go there because of the sharks are super well connected and people answer their phone calls. Now that's very valuable. So your network is unique to you. That same thing, yes, it's true for Mark Cuban, it's just as true for a 21-year-old college student who happens to know all the best graduates from his class at Stanford who are gunning towards computer security positions. That's a good person to know. A recruiter wants to know him. The companies that he's interviewing for want to know him. They're more likely to give him a job because they want to help him to help recruit other qualified candidates. Your network is actually it, probably one of the most important lines on your resume at that point, the invisible lines, I suppose, at this point, that exists. Because when you start, you're equally valuable or non-valuable as another person with zero days of experience. But if you have zero days of experience and you know 30 other people really well and they'll take your call, that is a huge value proposition that is unique to you. It's only yours, that network. Other people might have a similar one. There might be people that have built an even stronger one. You're the one that's sitting in front of them right there that wants that job. That's a huge advantage. You can bring value to somebody with $100 million in their bank account, even if you're broke as a joke, negative, all in the red, because you have a great network full of people that they're looking to hire, acquire, interview, doesn't matter what it is. So what you ask yourself is, would you rather be irreplaceable or someone who's only as good as their investment check? Right, those sharks, they compete over those deals. And they don't say, sometimes they say, I'll give you more money, but usually they say, I know everyone at QVC. Well, okay, done, if it's a product. Oh, well, I've been making clothes for 20 years at FUBU. Well, okay, I'm gonna work with you then. They don't just say, I'll give you 20 grand more for, for less of a percentage. It happens occasionally, but only when they can't differentiate based on their skill set or their network. Now, now that we know who's in our network because we're making these lists, we gotta figure out how to level up, right? And business fundamentally is people selling things to other people, usually people they know, like, and trust. And that's why country clubs exist. I'm, I'm positive of this. That's why people go golfing all the time. Sure, it's fun, but mostly, especially in the early stages of corporate, uh, corporatism, you're, you're creating relationships, and that's kind of what it's billed as. And everyone's maybe heard this Jim Rohn quote, you only go as high as your five closest friends. I'm not saying you have to ditch your friends, it's not a feel good session. This is not a uh, Instagram video. I will spare you that. But networking and relationship development, this is one of the best ways to make sure you are surrounded with high quality people. You guys work at Google. This is great. You're surrounded by, by high quality people a lot of the day. But I know a lot of high performers that are really good. They have great careers. Their personal life is a freaking dumpster fire. 
because they live with somebody who's unemployed and plays video games all day. And all they do is complain about their ex-girlfriend or their ex-husband or boyfriend. And they're smoking weed all the time and they don't go to the gym and they're dropping garlic chicken all over the floor. Like, you know, th we all know someone like that. In the next day, look at your appointment or calendar book. Over the past three to six months, who have you surrounded yourself with? With whom have you spent the most time? Are you satisfied with the influence those people have on you, right? Because if you're not, and you look at that calendar and you go, wow, I spent a lot of time with my high school buddies and they're not really doing anything. And I kind of have to pay for everything when we go out. And I don't know how much longer I want to deal with this. Now's a good time to make a change. Are you happy with the influence of your friends? Because that's something that you can change. You don't have to ditch your friends, but finding out who's giving you a positive influence and who's giving you a negative one is, is usually a pretty good look once every year, every other year. Now, this is not a game you play because you wanna, it's not a popularity contest. You're not climbing the ladder. Don't play this game because you wanna enjoy the spoils of victory, right? It's important to me personally. I like helping people. I know you all are probably the same way. Don't build your network around somebody that has no integrity. I see this a lot in the, this, I hate this word, but here we go, influencer space. There's all these people who are like, make money in real estate. Oh, if you invest in my drop shipping thing, you're gonna make all this money on Amazon. It's all garbage. They all share each other's stuff, in my opinion, are completely morally bankrupt. And the reason that they do this and generate success is because they're willing to completely lie. Now it's very tempting to go, man, if I just hang out more with these schmoes, I can build a huge business and then later on I'll be ethical because you know I'll have this huge audience. That's not really how this works. My inbox, my social life is littered with people, former friends who thought they were gonna go do something unethical for a second and then back out of it later and are still busy doing all that stuff because that's, they get addicted to the money. It's really a lot easier than building something valuable uh, and tricking people is an easy road to riches for a lot of people. So don't build your network around those people, people who steal from others or don't have integrity. It will rub off on you. You cannot, you cannot lie, what is it? Don't lie down, lie down with dogs, you're gonna get fleas. That is never more true than online or in the internet or in the corporate world, it really is. It's also, this is an important exercise to do, this calendar review. Because unless you've been very intentional about your process of filtering in the right people, your life might be full of people that are more than satisfied with mediocrity. And that's it's a bummer, but it's really bad when you look at the new science around network effects. And I wish I had this science handy, but there are studies now that show that if your friend's friend's friend smokes, you are X percent more likely to smoke. If your friend's friend's friend's, this is someone you don't know and have never met, is X number of pounds overweight, you are more likely to also be overweight. We really can't avoid this. So when we, when we look at people, when we look at who we're curating in our sphere, you have to be really careful about who's right next to you. And hopefully those people are also being very careful about who's right next to them because of these network effects. I'm gonna add that at some point because that, that science is disturbing to say the least. And it's one of those things where you read it and you go, wow, I really hope that's not true because it seems very unavoidable. Now, if you surround yourself with high achievers, both at home and at work, you're gonna crush, right? And then you have to avoid those network effects, but you're gonna do a lot better and you're gonna feel a lot better. It's gonna be easier for you. You're not gonna have emotional baggage waiting for you when you get home with your roommate or whatever. And when you're building relationships, bear in mind, people want to help you, right? They want to reciprocate everything that they've gotten from you. This isn't metaphysical, this isn't like some DVD of the secret or some other garbage that's been debunked over and over. This is something that is very, very measurable. Now, whenever somebody helps you, you often feel like, I wanna help them back. You might not know how to do it, but if you're banking social capital and goodwill, people will look for opportunities to help you. And if they don't, you can always ask them. If you don't think this works, look at things like charities. They are, the top performers rely on this all the time. Charities are loaded with the well-to-do and the well-connected. High-performing institutions like this one are loaded with people that understand intuitively reciprocity. I mentioned this before, but dig your well before you're thirsty. Harvey McKay wrote this like in the 90s. He's brilliant. The number one rule of your relationships and your network is build it before you need it. Once you need a job, not effective to go looking for one or not as effective. Once you need something from someone, it's not gonna be as effective. 
I know people like to kick the can down the road and procrastinate on this. Procrastination leads to stagnation when it comes to your personal and professional relationships. If you wait, it gets a lot harder. And I know just, you know this, right? Who would you rather help? Somebody who's you've known for three months, you've worked with them, they've texted you every three months just once to see how you were doing, or somebody who cold calls you with the Herbalife pitch, right? It's a really easy calculation to make. And waiting to build relationships only when you need them, it's kind of like trying to put a spare tire in the trunk of your car after you find yourself stranded on the highway. And this is a drill that I do every day and I highly recommend you do the same thing or an exercise. I call it Connect Four. What I do is I open up my phone, open up the text messaging app, scroll all the way to the bottom. You know, those threads where it's like, we had lunch one time four years ago at a conference. And then there's like another friend of yours in there you never kept in touch with. Reach out to those weak and dormant ties is what we call them weak and dormant network ties. Just re-engage one to four. I do one because I literally do this every single day. But if you find yourself only doing it on Tuesday, do four at a time. You'll find that when you re-engage people, and I'll tell you how to do that in just a second, when you, when you do this, you're gonna find that maybe 70, 75% of people respond. And you're not going to see a lot of opportunity right away. But as you become top of mind for dozens or even hundreds of people, you find and I find routinely that somebody I texted three weeks ago will go, hey, Jordan, do you still do speaking? Yeah, why? Uh, well, we're looking for a keynote for our annual sales event, and you're just fresh in my head because of our recent conversation. Great, there's $25,000 that I wasn't gonna get before sending a text instead of looking at Instagram again or being in a Starbucks line and deciding to send those Connect Four instead of just killing time reading Reddit. You know who you are. I'm one of those people, right? So you want to constantly, yeah, fly that flag. So you know that this is something that it's not, look, it sounds like it's going to be tedious. You think, oh, I'm going to have all these ongoing conversations. Yeah, where it's so easy. Most people, let's say 50-50 response rate, 75% response rate, you're going to have three or four texts go by. They don't want to meet up and hang, they're not gonna invite you to their wedding, okay? They just go, hey, haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, nice to talk to you, what's your update? What are you looking for? Here's how you re-engage. I say, hey, whatever their name is, use their name so it's not like, hey, friend, because that's, that sounds like, again, you know, some MLM dropping in. Use their name, say, it's been a while, what's the latest with you? Here's my quick update. Usually, I just had a kid a month ago, so I'm like, this is what happened in my life, boom. I have a little URL with my kids' photos. And they're like, whoa, big deal. And then I sign it with my name, right? Because what you don't want is new phone, who dis? Or, if they're anything like me, I go, well, if they don't know who this is, then I can just never answer. And they'll never know, right? That way I can forget about it. So what you wanna do is sign it, and that way, when it comes in, they can pretend or search their mind for who you are. Use your first and last name. Don't be like, it's Sam. Somebody wrote in recently and they're like, oh, what's up, man? Talking a huge update. And then they get on the phone and he's like, is this Sam? And she's like, yeah, I, we met at this random event a few weeks ago. And he's like, I've been talking to a mysterious woman and I can't remember how I met you. And I shared a lot of personal information. And now she thinks we wanna work together on something. And he was a videographer and he's like, yeah, this is gonna be great. I loved working with you last time. Has no idea what, who she is, how they met, what she wants, nothing. So use your first and last name. It'll save you a little bit of a hassle. And it will increase your response rate as well because people go, oh, Jordan Harbinger, right, cool. Yeah, good to hear from you, man. It's been a while. Again, this is scalable. It takes about four minutes to send four texts. I use the shortcuts in my phone. I basically just tailor it with the name and that's pretty much it. I change it up every week. It's really, really easy. So this is fully scalable. It yields a ton of responses. It doesn't take up any time that you would be doing anything else that's valuable and it will bring opportunity back to you at a very quick clip. And if it doesn't bring opportunity to you, it brings you the opportunity to connect those people to one another. And it's a great way to re-engage all these weak and dormant ties. So for those of you thinking, I don't know anyone. Yes, you do. Look in that text app. There's a bunch of people in there that you've lost touch with, many of whom would be worth at least a text. Now, everyone who's worked at my company, the Jordan Harbinger Show, they get their jobs through networking. I if I had a bunch more time and this was a bunch of students, I'd go through the stats, but the short version is the TLDR is this. 80% of people find jobs through networking. They don't apply on a website. They don't walk in the door. They don't door knock. They don't 
No, it's always referral. It's networking. That's how they get their opportunity. A lot of head shaking. I assume that probably happened to you either here or somewhere else. So remember, ABG, always be giving, always be generous. Connecting is a constant process of asking for and offering help, but it's not about the Rolodex. It's about the action. You have to make those intros. That is the key. Networking, it's a muscle. It grows with use. The more you use these connections, the stronger they get. If you hoard your network, it atrophies. It's not a pie where, oh, I used that connection to my friend Yaka at Google. I can't use it again. No. You want to, it's like a synapse in the brain. Use it as much as you can as long as there's value there. That's how you make strong relationships. So it all comes down to ABG, always be giving, and doing so in a systemized way. And I'll leave you with a little brief story. If you're not as comfortable asking for help as you are giving it, because that's where a lot of us fall in. It's like, well, I give a lot of help. I just don't ask for anything for myself. I was the same way, and, and it took me years to get over this. But when I applied to law school, I didn't get in pretty much anywhere. I got a full scholarship to a local university in Michigan that I found out later was owned by the family that owns Domino's Pizza. And I went home and I told my dad, I go, oh, I got a full ride here. And he goes, isn't that the Domino's Pizza Law School? You're the pizza lawyer. And I was like, never going to that school because I don't want to hear that for the next rest of my entire life from my dad and all my relatives. So I applied to the University of Michigan, which at the time, and I think still is, a top 10 law school in the nation. And I had no freaking chance, pretty much, of getting in. And I knew that, but I wanted to stay at Michigan. I went there for undergrad. And you know, a lot of attorney friends of mine and their parents, they said, hey, if you get into Michigan, you have to go. Like you, this is a career-making school. You can get your any kind of job you want out of law school. It's a big deal. So I applied, and I promptly got waitlisted. And then they told me at the end of the summer, you're not getting into Michigan have a nice life, whatever those letters say. And in desperation, I reached out to a lot of my buddies because they had gotten into Michigan already. And I said, oh man, I didn't get in. What should I do? You know, I got, I'm going to be the pizza lawyer. And they're like, well, yeah, that's, it's a bummer because we're all in and we thought you would be a good addition. You could live with us and everything. But well, I was reading on this forum, there's one guy at one school some year, he wrote a letter and he wrote it in like a legal argument kind of format. And then he sent it to the dean of admissions and they were really impressed. And then they let him in and he wrote this story on a forum. And I was like, how do I do that? And they're like, well, it just so happens we are in the class that teaches you legal writing right now. So I drove up to Ann Arbor and they showed me how to write this letter. And I formatted the letter and I sent it off via email. And I thought, well, that was probably a waste of time, but at least I got to see my friends. And then Three days later, I got a phone call that said, hey, I'm going to bring the admissions committee together. Uh, we're going to meet about this. But, you know, an unusual move, man. Uh, props for that. No guarantees. A week later, they told me that I was admitted not for the next year, but the year after to the University of Michigan Law School. So think about this. I got into one of the best law schools in America where I didn't quite maybe have the grades, definitely didn't quite have the test scores because I asked. And I had other things going for me, of course, but I remember they'd already made their decision not to let me in. I asked again and I got help from my network and then I got into that law school. And I will tell you, I get a reminder of just how valuable that experience was every single month when I pay my student loans. <laughs> and I know that we are basically out of time. We probably have time for like one or two questions. Do you ever find it cumbersome or difficult to maintain or keep these uh, connections or relationships? Yeah, actually, I did until I started using systems. So using the Connect4, which I mentioned earlier, using the CRM um, that contactually that I use. I explained how to do this. I actually, I have a free course on how to do all this. It's not like a, a new your credit card number free. It's literally just free. Uh, it's all about the systems I use, how I re-engage, how I manage all these connections. It's at jordanharbinger.com slash course. It's called Six Minute Networking. And the reason is because it takes only a few minutes per day to do Connect Four, to use the CRM, uh, I go over how to introduce yourself, how to do the double opt-in intro in more detail, and also because five-minute networking was taken. So it's six-minute networking, <laughs> and that's at jordanharbinger.com slash course. Thanks to everybody who came because they listened to the Jordan Harbinger Show, and thanks to everybody who came who didn't, but now probably, hopefully, maybe will. And thank you for your time.